Are we seeing, you know, are we seeing an example of, of higher mass stars, maybe pop three stars um, in these galaxies? And it could be, um, could it be related to the stochasticity of, of star formation, sort of star bursts and variability in the star formation histories? Three minutes. Um, and so we're going to hear, I'm sure, about these and other options uh, throughout this week. I'm really excited to see what, what everybody has um, on, these, on these and related topics. But just to, to briefly talk about a few of these, um, let's look at the low redshift interloper option. Um, so we actually do have several spectroscopic confirmations of galaxies in the Sears sample. This is, these plots are showing um, from two of Pablo's papers um, and one by Seiji Fuj Fujimoto. Um, looking at if you combine the Sears and the DDT um, uh, spectroscopic programs, we have uh, spectroscopic confirmation of 14 galaxies above redshift 8.5, and four of those are bright galaxies above redshift 10. And that includes Maisie's galaxy, which is in the upper, upper right, um, plus redshift 11.4. So our sample, the, the, the portion that, that we've followed up spectroscopically so far, has relatively few interlopers. And this is, this is not just us, we've, we're, seeing high, we're seeing spectroscopic confirmation of high redshift galaxies in jades and glass and other programs. So it, we of course would, would love and, and need to have more spectroscopic follow-up of these samples, but it does not seem to be the case that there's you know, rampant contamination or low redshift contamination. Another possibility, increasing the AGN contribution to the galaxy luminosities. Definitely possible. We're, of course, seeing a lot of, of observational evidence of AGN in the early universe. Um, in, the, in, uh, in Sears, we've seen many cases of SEDs that are sort of dominated by stellar light, but then they have spectroscopic signatures of AGN. So some examples here are Rebecca Larson's paper, Dale Kachevsky's paper, where we're seeing these sort of broadened wings of the, of, um, in, indicative of an AGN in galaxies that were selected with very stellar dominated SEDs. We also, there's this, this sample of extremely red objects that have sort of a blue flat rest UV continuum and then a very, very red continuum towards the, the rest frame optical. These galaxies have um, morphologies, they generally have morphologies in the redder bands that are more point-like, so that could indicate that the AGN light is starting to dominate at the rest frame optical, but perhaps that the stellar light is still dominating at the, the rest frame UV. So, you know, it's, it's a little, I'm not, I'm not sure that we can conclusively say anything about this yet. Of course, more observations are, are, are coming and, and that's gonna be really exciting. This is a question that's gonna be very exciting to see. Um, but it does not seem to be the case that the UV light from these galaxies is, is overwhelmingly dominated by AGN. So could the, the dust attenuation of these galaxies be changing? I'm, I'm gonna go through uh, a few more options relatively quickly here just to, to show some, some possibilities because I know we'll hear more about this soon. This is a plot showing um, the Sears observations again against a few sort of post-launch um, uh, models. So one is by Ferrara et al. That, that created a UV luminosity function that matches that at redshift seven and also matches the, the obscured luminosity function from the REBELS program and ex, you know, extended to redshift 10.5 with significantly reduced dust attenuation, we see this green curve. It's above our observations, but it, it has you know, really moved up that, that predicted density of galaxies. However, if you remember Alexa Morales's sample of, of UV beta and, and some other work, where early results seem to show that there really isn't this strong evolution in UV slopes. So it's a little bit, sort, you know, so this is an up in the air uh, explanation. Um, could there be more efficient star formation? So Jones et al. Have, Michaela, um, we're at time, so if you can wrap it up. Oh, sure. I'll just uh, do this quickly. So we could be seeing examples of um, more efficient star formation where you get, you get earlier star formation in, his, in, in halos. That, that's sort of this, this pink line. We could also be seeing uh, Dekel et al. have an um, example of a, what they're calling the feedback-free starburst model, which if I could summarize my limited understanding, is that you can get very efficient, very quick star formation before the feedback from, say, supernova sort of pushes everything out. And finally, or not, we, we could be having a changing IMF. Um, Aaron Young with the graft, I think it's called, I think it's pronounced, uh, model and update of the Santa Cruz SAM shows that if you, with boosted UV luminosities, which 
or uh, that's the same as a decreased mass to light ratio, you could be seeing evidence of, um, you, you, can, you can sort of recover the, the observed densities and that, that could be indicative of a top heavy IMF or pop three stars. And finally, variability from a bursty star formation or from feedback that turns on and off could preferentially be scattering galaxies from uh, halos into, in, could be scattering them into brighter luminosities because given the, the shape of the UV luminosity function, if you're scattering things to be brighter and fainter, you would expect more things to scatter bright. So those are all possible options. I'm really excited to, to hear more about them this week and in the coming years. Um, it's, just, it's just such an exciting time to be, um, to be working in the high redshift universe with JWST. So I will, I will end there and, and leave up my, my summary here and, and happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions? We only have a little bit of time. Hi, it's Janice Lee from Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, there are, I'm sure, a lot more other uh, issues that you didn't cover that could possibly explain uh, the UV luminosity function. But, you know, people don't try not to think about binary evolution with massive stars, but they cause a lot of problems. And also rotation, can you comment on those two things? Yeah, I think those are, those are definitely very possible explanations that we're, we're hoping to start to incorporate some of those into, into future models, but we, we certainly haven't yet. Um, but yeah, very, very possible explanations. I think, right, it's probably not going to be any one thing, right? It will be a combination of all of these. It may be some combination of all of these effects, but what'll be, what's, what's exciting is seeing how, how, how is the physics of star formation and galaxy evolution changing at these early times. Thank you. One last question. Okay, I'll take the opportunity to ask one question. What will it take to get a sample of redshift 13 galaxies to understand the luminosity function at the highest redshifts? Yeah, um, 10, 10 ultra deep JWST fields, <laughs> Un unlimited JWST time. No, I think, um, I think that, more, more, t more JWST deep fields. I think we, if I could be super greedy, I would want uh, um, to go as deep as we can and covering as many pointings as we can, so that we're for overcoming cosmic variance and really getting to look at these sort of ultra rare galaxies at, at high redshift. So, so more, <laughs> the, t the TAC should approve more deep fields. Well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And if you can turn the lights down. Uh, welcome uh, our second speaker, Roger Windhorst, and I'll give you a two minute warning. Thank you, sir. Folks, thank you for inviting me here. It's great to be back after so many years. It's also great to see so many young folks in the audience that are um, using JWST in ways that we would have never imagined. Um, if possible, um, apologize to the handwritten note takers. If you could make it completely dark, that we um, stand out better. So I'm going to talk about the crown jewels of the uh, JWST Pearls project. As interdisciplinary scientists, I had a, a large team of folks that is still growing today, about 120 folks today, over 18 time zones. And I'm going to talk about fields like this, not unlike Sears, but taken in a different way at the North Ecliptic Pole, where you can do arbitrary um, rotation and study things like uh, time domain. Um, so, let's see. The Pearls team, as I said, spread all across the world. Uh, many different components, many folks involved in different. Is it not on? 
Like that? Okay, better yet. All right. I guess my AST 100 class voice didn't suffice. Um, <clears throat> okay, so PEARLS stands for the Prime Extragalactic Areas for Reionization and Lensing Science. We have an overview paper here. It's a mix of medium deep uh, NERCAM fields. I left the deep fields to uh, the other GTO and GO proposers. Um, <clears throat> some best lensing clusters that includes Brenda Fry and a group at U of A and a large number of cluster experts as well as some high redshift QSOs about which I'm not gonna say much today. So I will talk about the crown jewels and in particular I will focus on the extremes in cosmic star formation. Um, that turns out to be a factor of 10 to the seven in star formation rate. Um, is it possible to turn at least some of the overhead headlights on? Let there be dark. We pay $10 billion for dark skies. We don't wanna ruin that here. Um, <coughs> Anyway, so, I think I need to point there. This is part of the NEP uh, time domain field. <laughs> no, not Genesis 1. Uh, let there be dark, Massimo. Thank you. Um, so, I, I, I can't possibly summarize all the results, so I'll pick and choose the highlights. We see tidal tails everywhere. Um, between galaxies, old stars that are being pulled out because of tidal effects. A paper by Summers, my, one of my undergrads, talk about it in a minute. Um, less than 1% of the objects are variable papers by O'Brien and Jensen. And uh, gravitational lensing, including galaxy galaxy lensing, is not uncommon. We see it in a percent or two of all the massive uh, galaxies. An example to be shown in just a minute. So here is the uh, SMAX 0723, the first uh, public image that came out on July 11 last year. It's actually 10 degrees away from the LMC, and within an hour after we got the data, we found this. This is the usual A, B magnitude versus who with half max. This is the stellar sequence. We can see stars to almost 28 magnitudes. And we found that it had, this, my undergrad found this, it had 10 times more stars than the other North ecliptic pole fields we have, which are 180 degrees away in the sky. They should have similar star counts. They don't. So what are these? With the six filters we had, we could do uh, spectral type fitting. And so we actually have distances for these stars to 27 magnitude. And there is an excess around the uh, distance modulus, you know, 40 to 100 kiloparsec of the LMC SMC. So this field does contain stars in the uh, leading arm. Because Gaia saw that too, it was designed to do that, but we see it 10 magnitudes fainter. So thank you, JWST, great discovery. So here is an um, attenuation imprint of the um, background lighting elliptical galaxies in VV191 with the foreground spiral here, um, where you can really see the dust lanes well imprinting on the um, elliptical galaxy light, which is easy to model. And you can use this, uh, we had four filters of NeurCam uh, to do pixel to pixel decomposition. And we find um, that the attenuation curves pleads for you know, smaller values of uh, the uh, selective extinction R value of the order of you know, one and a half to 1.7 instead of three paper by Kiel. Um, my grad student Jessica Berkheimer found hundreds of globular clusters in this uh, elliptical at redshift 0.05. Um, we also found a nice example of galaxy galaxy lensing. Here is a background galaxy just like that one, but now at a redshift of one, nicely arced with a counter image here. That gives us a good mass of the central elliptical and the mass to light ratio. It's all in this paper. It's a spectacular image. We hope to do more of that. This is probably to me one of the more exciting things. Again, it's an example of um, extremely low star formation. We found a dwarf galaxy um, in the parallel module of uh, one of the lensing clusters that we uh, targeted, CLG1212. And this galaxy has a spectroscopic redshift of 0.010, and it's completely isolated in redshift space. Here's the Virgo cluster, the Coma cluster, Great Wall, and some other filament in it. Here it's more than 800 kilometers the second away from its nearest neighbor. It has a TGRB distance of 31 megaparsecs with a relatively small error, as you can see here, a paper by Carlton and Al soon to be submitted. And um, <clears throat> this is one of the higher TGRB uh, 
PRGB distances that we have been able to do, or the community has been able to do. And so this is an extremely red, old, isolated dwarf galaxy with a vanishingly small star formation rate. For the record, the star formation rate is 33 Earth masses per year. It's non-existent, yeah? And, and it is asymmetric. Why is it asymmetric? Because it's isolated. Some cold dark matter theorists get very excited about this. I won't speculate further. Um, here is our um, massive, uh, one of the most massive known clusters, El Gordo, redshift 0.87, with highly stretched and spaghettified images of background galaxies. Um, and this uh, beautiful, uh, this one is called, by the way, La Flaca. El Gordo means the fat one. La Flaca is the thin one, as in Laurel and Hardy. And this is El Anzuelo. I call it Einstein's fish hook. Um, a modest uh, galaxy, not that massive, actively star forming uh, with about 80 solar masses a year. Papered by Kamineski et al. Um, came out last month in a, a release and also um, um, a number of papers, as you saw there. Uh, let's look at the dwarfs once more. In El Gordo, we find also a very large number of uh, low density or ultra diffuse dwarfs. Some of them are so inconspicuous you can't see them with the lights on, but here they are. Uh, there is uh, thousands of them uh, compared to the distribution in uh, Coma and Virgo and Fornax in terms of uh, stellar surface density versus K-corrected uh, surface brightness. You can see they're a little brighter, a little uh, more actively star forming, uh, higher surface brightness. Yet they have rather low star formation rates of about 0.1 solar mass a year. Um, now we get to the higher star formation rates. As I said, El Anzuelo has 80 solar masses a year. This is it D-Lens, got a very dusty core, some asymmetric disk. Uh, and this is you know, one of these beautiful things you can do in a good uh, lensing, uh, uh, with good lensing models, uh, papered by Kamineski et al. Here's another extreme star forming case, 1400 solar masses a year for one of the two bright submillimeter galaxies in this same cluster. Um, it is rather dusty. It looks like kind of a, like a barred spiral. It's redshift 4.26. Here's another one, very similar total um, submillimeter uh, luminosity. It has a much lower uh, extinction of about one magnitude. This, this guy over here has about five magnitudes. And the other uh, submillimeter galaxy is about 400 solar masses a year. Uh, you know, reasonably high extreme. So one of them is completely opaque in the uh, UV optical and another one shines through pretty nicely. Uh, just to show you the extremes of star formation. And here is our high redshift radio galaxy, TNJ 1338, now also being done with the IFU by Overseer and Heckman and their postdoc. Redshift 4.11, first discovered with HST, giant Lyman alpha cloud, the AGN is here. There is a radio jet that uh, shines in this direction towards one o'clock. Uh, we did it with five medium band filters, including an O2 and an H alpha filter. And the beast has a star formation rate of 1600 solar masses a year. Uh, you do, if you do the decomposition with you know, a pixel to pixel SED models, you find that in, indeed about a third of the star formation rate uh, comes from the, the jet induced phenomena. So this AGN is very capable of triggering one third of its own galaxy. Um, then last but not least, we have G165, one of our most beautiful lensing clusters uh, that was selected to be one of the brightest Planck sources in the sky. Lo and behold, it has some very actively star forming uh, red galaxies that are highly stretched, redshift 1.78 and redshift 2.1-ish, I think. Um, beauty of this is, of course, the star formation rate as seen in H alpha with a, a NERSPEC DD follow up program by Brenda Fry is about two, 300 solar masses a year. Um, if you look at the total Planck selection, it's about 10 times met, as much, so it's a rather extremely star forming beast. And lo and behold, if you uh, stare carefully, uh, there was a point source here and there and there which turns out a supernova type 1A at a redshift 1.783 confirmed with LBT and, and then later on uh, with NERSPEC in much more detail. And um, here's the enlargement, dozens and dozens of reliable um, image families with MUSE redshifts and what have you not. And we hope to with three images and three epochs, so nine images in total, 
to measure the Hubble constant at Redshift 1.78. This is done by our uh, cluster sub team here. Two independent teams are trying to completely blindly analyze that. Uh, we do think that regularly monitoring these clusters with extreme star formation can yield more supernova, more lens supernova. At this minimum star formation rate, you should get um, a lens supernova every few years. So worth monitoring for in the future. Our last and probably best image is MAX 0416, 22 hours, also done by um, 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 the Canucks team. Absolutely beautiful paper by Jan Adal on 12 new caustic transits at uh, the peak of cosmic star formation, and a paper on an extremely magnified binary star, a redshift 2.09. Um, I can't get over it how beautiful these images are and how many objects are flickering behind. Um, these clusters. So uh, to be um, monitored, I'm sure, in, in the future, if we do this correctly, I think we can get the IMF directly at cosmological distances by just counting the stars, including double stars. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, audience. <coughs>so I didn't show it, didn't want to complicate it, the oh, color, right. color, color magnitude diagram, but it's very convincing. Yeah. And we have, you know, 70 of them. Other questions? Jennifer Wiseman, this is amazing. <laughs> Roger, these are just incredible. Um, just a little pr practical question. Builders, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, like the last image you showed, it's clear that diffraction spikes from foreground stars are crossing the image. Does that hamper your ability to do the science that um, you want to do? Not really. This is the Anton Kukamo rendering where most of that was did it out. I have a version, I promised you the 48 inch printout, which I brought that looks a little more ugly. Yes, you have to exclude that area when you do object finding and occasionally it's annoying, but you know, I think some of these old MAX clusters were chosen to be close to nearby stars for ground-based AO purposes. I wouldn't have done it that way, but that's what it is, so there you go. Um, but that ain't no star, by the way. This thing is a blue elliptical, yeah, or whatever that is. Um, but yeah, there is a bright star over here, obviously. And we'll thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, I should take this off. <laughs> Okay, our next speaker is Maximilian Franco. Um, welcome. Hi, so good morning. My name is uh, Maximilian Franco. I'm a postdoc at the University of Texas. So first of all, thanks for having me here. During this talk, I will first present or introduce the Cosmos Web Survey and uh, speak about the early results we get about the epoch of reionization. And all this work has been made possible with uh, thanks to this absolutely wonderful team. The reionization of the intergalactic medium is a relatively fast process. We know that it stops at redshift around six with a midpoint at redshift 7.7, .7, but it's still difficult to have a big picture of it, especially toward the beginning of the reionization to know, for example, what are the main drivers of the reionization, if it's low mass galaxies or high mass galaxies. And until the launch of the James Webb, we were limited to galaxies at redshift up to nine, with a lot of questions about the number of galaxies at redshift nine, and especially the number of bright galaxies um, at redshift nine, with some, some, an excess of galaxies compared to the expectation, the solid black line here. 
It was also a huge debate on the evolution of the UV luminosity function at redshift greater than 8, with some studies showing a slowdown on this UV luminosity function, or some questions on the evolution of the stellar mass density to know if at this redshift the stellar mass density follow the mass density of the dark matter at us. And this limitation was not due to the sensitivity of the Hubble Space Telescope, but mainly due to the filters limited to see the Lehman break at redshift up 10 or 11. And it's the reason why during the last six years, the most distant galaxy remain uh, GNZ 11 at redshift 10.6. This barrier has been overcome with a lot of more distant galaxies discovered now and spectroscopic confirmations until redshift 13. There are a lot of things we don't know about the, the reionization, but we know that the reionization is a patchy process. On the uh, right image that shows a slice of the universe at redshift 7 and redshift 9, the uh, pink patches are the distribution of the ionized hydrogen. The blue patches are the distribution of the neutral um, intergalactic medium. And the idea is to go wider to cover this variation. If, he if we restrict ourselves to small area, for example, this small square is the size of the Hubble deep field, we can stay only on region of neutral uh, IGM or ionized IGM. And it's really the idea behind Cosmos Web as, uh, to go as wide as possible to cover this, uh, this variation. The Cosmos Web Survey covers the central part of the Cosmos field, and we benefit from an extensive um, coverage in wavelengths from X-ray to radio. We benefit from also an HST A-band image that optimizes the detection of galaxies at redshift 6 and 7. And it's an equatorial field, so we can benefit from a lot of uh, follow-up, especially with ALMA, and benefits from the uh, complementarity between these two instruments. And COSMOS is also selected as a calibration field for many future projects. The COSMOS Web um, Survey is the largest uh, cycle one program, both in terms of time, it's 255 hours, and in terms of area, with a uniform coverage with NIRCAM of 0.54 square degrees through four filters, and a non-contiguous coverage with MIRI of 0.2 uh, square degrees. During the first year of James Webb, a great effort has been made for this deep field with different observational strategies. A little bit like a wedding cake with some very deep surveys, such as uh, NG Deep or uh, shallower but larger survey, uh, such as Cosmos Webb. And to put this survey in perspective, on the right part of this image, it's the distribution of the depth as a function of the area. The vertical lines are the depths in the different filters in this survey, and the point here is not to show or to say that uh, one survey is better than another, but to present the great complementarities between uh, these different strategies. In this table, we have the number of galaxies we expect to discover in, uh, in Cosmos Web. It's more than 500 galaxies at redshift greater than 8, more than 12 galaxies at redshift 12, and if we add all the galaxies at redshift greater than 6 during the epoch of reionization, we expect to, de to detect between 4,600 and 6,400 galaxies. Cosmos Web has been observed in three times. The first part, the red part, has been observed at the beginning of the year in January. It's this image, and you can access to the reduced image by uh, scanning this uh, QR code. And regularly, we will update this, uh, this data reduction. Few uh, months ago, 50% of the survey has been observed. It's the green part on the bottom. And at the beginning of next year, in January, the blue part will be uh, observed. I will mainly present the result of the first part, the first 4% of the survey, the red part here. In this 4% of the survey, we detected 15 galaxies candidates at redshift greater than 9. We can see the spatial distribution on the left, the SEDs on the right, and until uh, spectroscopic confirmation, it will remain uh, candidates. 
with possibly some low redshift contaminants. But we are quite confident with uh, this selection because with a selection criteria quite similar in SIRS, the confirmation rate for galaxies at redshift 9 reaches uh, 90%. This is only 4% of Cosmos Web are approximately as large as uh, other extragalactic surveys. We have here the distribution of the absolute UV magnitude as a function of the redshift. To give uh, here an example, GMZ11 is here. And because we are painter, we are, are biased toward the brightest uh, galaxies at redshift between uh, 9 and 11. We study the evolution of the UV beta slope as a function of the UV uh, magnitude. We didn't find extreme values of beta that seems to show that uh, 400 million years after the Big Bang, the universe is already enriched in metal. Our results are well aligned with the hydrodynamical simulations, the green line here, and we are a little bit below the result from the literatures because, because all the galaxies on the left on this plot are galaxies detected before the gem swap. There are galaxies extremely massive, and there is a correlation between the beta slope and the stellar mass uh, of galaxies. We also investigate the sizes of uh, these galaxies. We detect galaxies extremely compact with sizes between 200 and 600 uh, par sec. Other studies in Sears or in glass show uh, approximately uh, the same results. And if we go uh, further, the most distant galaxies is even more compact with JED GS Z13. But even if these galaxies are extremely compact, we are able to resolve these galaxies. We also find a correlation between the brightness or the, the magnitude and the size, and this correlation is also uh, detected in uh, other surveys. The sizes increase also with the wavelengths, with the gradual contribution of the old uh, stellar population and the dust. Just a few words about uh, this 50% of this survey, the green part here. So we had the data just a few months ago, so it's early a preliminary analysis. In this image, we can see more than 300,000 galaxies, and among these galaxies, some are very distant and very bright. It's the case for the four galaxies in green here. And you can see uh, the galaxies on the right with uh, SCD, the SCDs of these galaxies. And these very bright galaxies allow us to investigate the bright end of the UV luminosity function at redshift between 12 and 12, redshift 11. And we can see the good complementarity between the different surveys, the different approaches between NGDeep, Sears, and Cosmos Web. And we reach a consensus of uh, the shape of this UV luminosity function at redshift 11, showing an excess of bright galaxies compared to studies uh, pre James Webb. We also investigate the buildup of the stellar mass of these galaxies, and if the redshift and the stellar masses of these galaxies are confirmed, some of these galaxies, the uh, green galaxies, are a little bit more massive than uh, expected and we find a conversion factor between the dark matter halos and the baryon of 0.3 for the most massive galaxies at redshift 10 and 0.5 at uh, redshift 12 for the most uh, massive galaxies. And that leaves only a little room for other uh, components of galaxies. I leave you with my conclusion and thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll take questions. I probably have a silly question. Um, in Cosmos Web, you guys only have four bands, right? 
So yeah, yeah uh, do you have a way of, um, or are you thinking of, of a way remedy this? Because uh, when we are doing SED fitting using four bands, um, that certainly is a limitation, right? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have only uh, four bands, 115, 150, 277, and 444. We benefit also from a very good uh, ancillary data with HST, with a lot of instruments. If, and if we focused on galaxies at redshift 9 and above redshift 9, it's also because the Lyman break is in one of the gem swap filter, and it gives us more confidence on the redshift. But with four filters, we are limited, a little bit limited for, for SED fitting, but at redshift 9, and with HST in high band for redshift 6 and 7, we are uh, relatively confident on the redshift determination. Any other questions? Go. Hi, it's Janice Lee, uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. So um, I, I'm not a high redshift person, I'm more like a megaparsec person uh, for galaxies. And it would be interesting to know, what are the standard models you use to fit SEDs at high redshift? What metallicities do you assume? Like what goes into the models? Because we do the same at lower redshift, so it would be interesting to hear, like across all the surveys, if there's a standard um, set of parameters that are assumed for the fitting. So we used for, uh, thanks for this question, you use for the SED fitting a lot of different templates and uh, the result we, we get for, for these templates are completely, the results we get are consistent what we expect with a very low metallicity. Uh, for example, uh, we see the slope uh, relatively blue and we, we, we expect this blue slope for these very high redshift uh, galaxies. And we used standard templates and we add to these standard templates, templates uh, especially for high redshift galaxies that take into account uh, low metallicities. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thanks. Let's welcome Ha Jing Yan um, for the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, uh, I'm Ha Jing Yan from University of Missouri, Columbia. Um, last year, when uh, we first published uh, our uh, work on very high redshift, meaning very high redshift, Z large and 11 things in SMAX 0723, uh, we were very badly uh, smashed. Um, but in any case, it seems like a, a year um, then. You know, people are comfortable talking about Z larger than 11, okay, and a lot of those. So, which is what, you know, we are here today talking about um, our work. And this is a work that um, I um, have been doing with uh, some of my uh, current and previous graduate students. And uh, for those of you who were in SESTO two months ago, I apologize because um, you know, about 60% of the slides are the same. Uh, but we do have 40% of the slides that are different, which um, make a difference. So, uh, and I imagine that uh, there are quite some people here who are not high Z persons, so I'm leaving this uh, on. Let me see whether I can play this. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so uh, the characteristic Lyman break signature, uh, which doesn't depend on the intrinsic property of the galaxies that you are looking at, which is, you know, just governed by the uh, line of sight neutral hydrogen absorption, and this characteristic uh, break is moving through uh, various um, near cam bands and creating this break signature. So this is what basically what the feature that we are relying on to select very high range of galaxies. And uh, specifically for this work, we are uh, selecting 150W, 200W, and 270, uh, 277W dropouts, which are at very high redshifts. Uh, I'm gonna say more specific now. Um, you can forget about all those technical details, uh, but the upshot here is that uh, we are selecting 150 dropout, uh, that is at redshift about uh, 12.7, and 200 dropout uh, 17.3, and uh, all the way to 277W dropout, which is at uh, uh, 24 
0.7, if you want to believe that. Uh, and we are using all the public uh, NeuroCam data in cycle one uh, up to uh, July. And so here is a list of all those fields, a primer. Oh, there's a table here. Uh, USD, uh, UDS1 plus Cosmos, uh, because Cosmos field is already done. Uh, and Sears, um, NGD, Jade's Uncover uh, in uh, April 2744, uh, and also Glass. And uh, lastly, but not the least, uh, Yao SMAX 0723. So we use all of those. And uh, we use our own reduction uh, for the sake of consistency, except um, um, uh, in the, uh, the JS data, which is in Good South, because we don't have access to the raw data, right? Uh, but thanks, uh, they uh, published their, uh, they, they released their, um, reduced the data. So just to go over those very quickly, uh, go from the shallowest um, primer, UDS1, uh, UDS2 naturally is done, but we uh, haven't got time to put it in the uh, data, I mean, the drawbar selection yet. Um, so this is pretty wide, uh, 11, you know, 114 uh, square arc minutes, it, oh, and it's in uh, eight bands, which is great for this purpose, uh, but it's shallow. Uh, so for the three relevant bands, uh, most relevant bands for dropout search, uh, I listed here the, um, um, the, the exposure time, and those are the histograms, okay? So for the primary cosmos, um, it's of comparable size, uh, but it's uh, a lot deeper, effective, about effective to deeper. And uh, also to Sears, which is of comparable depth, but slightly um, narrower. And uh, NG Deep, uh, which we um, heard about, which is very deep, which is in uh, one of the parallel fields of Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And then we have uh, Jades in uh, Good South, okay? And this is the deepest, the deepest so far. And uh, we're also falling in uh, Uncover and also plus uh, DD2756, which is a DD time program, uh, adding uh, quite a bit of a uh, depth. So this is a cluster field, to remind you. Uh, 37.04 square augments, which is one of the largest cluster field that we have, uh, we have data so far. And glass, um, which is in the flanking field of April 2744, uh, which is pretty much not affected by, by lensing at all. Uh, and then lastly, of course, uh, SMAX 0723. Okay, so we have all those. And just to show you some of the dropouts, um, this is um, an example, three examples, uh, one for each uh, in, in the three categories. You, you, uh, this is 150W dropout, okay? And this is a 200W dropout. Well, this one is a 20, uh, 277 dropout. Uh, those SCD plus are down here. And uh, Sears, similar thing. Okay, so uh, in three categories and also in jades. Right? And uh, I can go on. This is uh, uncover. Okay, just to show you some examples. Uh, so we are doing everything that we can, pretty much. And for this talk, I'm going to focus uh, to focus on 150W dropout and uh, 200W dropout because they are easier to deal with. Okay, and we uh, discard those dropouts that are brighter than 26.0 uh, magnitude in uh, 356W because we were worrying about that, uh, you know, those might be, well, even if they are at very high relationship, that they might be contaminated by AGN. So uh, they, they shouldn't be falling in this uh, normal galaxy category. So we, we uh, for now, we remove them. So that's the statistics after removing all those uh, and then, you know, you can see that this is quite sizable sample. Uh, I would say this is the largest sample that you can get up to this point. So we have one, 136 F, uh, 150W dropouts and 52 200W dropouts. And uh, to again, to show you some examples, uh, yeah, we can see that. So this, uh, those are the positions of uh, 150W dropouts highlighted in green and uh, 200W dropouts highlighted in, in uh, red. Um, in UDS field, you can see that the distribution is highly um, um, inhomogeneous, right? Oh, yeah, but, but this part, this part is because of the problem that we, uh, we can see in the data. So this part is what we ex exclude. But if you look at, say, like this part, and also here, meaning that one or two near cam pointing can, you know, pretty much, oh, yeah, probably, yes. Um, yeah, for example, say like here, this is a good region this is also a good region, but you know, you, you do not see anything, uh, any drawbacks. You, you see things, sorry. 
uh, you just don't see those dropouts. So meaning that their distribution could be highly inhomogeneous. Right? Uh, similar things here for Cosmos. Okay, similar story here. And uh, this is Sears. Okay. And uh, to show you, this is NGD. NGD, surprisingly to us, that we actually do not have too many um, dropouts there. And uh, for, for Jades, Jades we have quite some, quite some here as well. All right, and uh, for uh, dropout selection, we need to worry about contamination, right? So back in the old time, when we do dropout selection, we only have uh, one band per, uh, to the redder side of the shifting band, so uh, we cannot do anything else other than do color-color diagram diagnostics. But now we have multiple bands, so we can do much better by doing SED fitting. So this is what we did. Uh, you know, and also in terms of uh, SED fitting, uh, there's a subtle difference between dropout search uh, screening of contaminations. Uh, you know, with respect to uh, uh, as compared to select uh, those high Z galaxies using photo Z in the first place. Okay, there's a subtle but very important difference. But I'm not gonna uh, get into those uh, details there. But the upshot here is that we can do similar things to screen, uh, to to reject those. Um, um, possible contaminants, and, uh, but those are really dependent on uh, what kind of tool you are using and what kind of templates you are using, right? So uh, for this work, we actually used uh, two versions, uh, two schemes to uh, reject those, so we call it scheme one and two. Scheme one is to do SED fitting using LaFar, uh, using BCO3 model with mission lines, uh, for those of you who care. Uh, and for easy, we use uh, those uh, you know, fine-tuned uh, high-z templates of uh, um, you know, set of three plus four. So we do this independently for every one of those. Okay, so uh, here are uh, here just to show you some good examples. Okay, good ones, good ones in scheme one, uh, good ones, good ones in scheme two. And uh, we also have bad ones, of course. Uh, those are bad ones in this scheme one. Bad ones in this scheme too. Okay, so they are. Uh, you know, uh, there's a big difference between these uh, two kinds of uh, objects. So after this uh, screening, uh, we, we, we did a really hard screening, uh, and uh, we pretty much reduced, um, uh, you know, we, we trimmed down something like about, about half from uh, the objects that we have. So this is the statistics in these two, two, two schemes. But the point here is that still um, about 50 percent or even more objects they survived. Right? So from there we can derive uh, luminosity functions, okay, uh, and like I said, we concentrate on 150W and 200 dropouts, okay, and uh, we also folding in those uh, uh, the candidates found in the um, lensing field and we uh, did this lensing magnification correction and we also account for incompleteness, we did everything, so this is what we got. Right. So the, in, this is scheme one, scheme two, for 150W dropout based luminosity function at ratio of about 12.7. Um, they are similar, right? Uh, and uh, there's also a dip here, um, which I don't know what to make of. Uh, but the upshot is that uh, now I think people uh, all agree. Those are way higher than any pre-JWST uh, pre theoretical predictions, way higher. Uh, similar things, if we go to, say, like, you know, a uh, 200W dropout based uh, luminosity function at uh, 17.3, similar things. And I need to point out that this uh, last point uh, is um, uh, from, from um, SMAX 0723 after a huge um, correction of amplification, about 36, effect of 36. Uh, and uh, we can put them, you know, oops, where is it now? Uh, yeah, we have uh, some suspicious features here, which is, uh, th this is one that I just mentioned, the dip here, and also uh, this uh, drop-off here, well, which drop-off could, could probably can be explained by small number statistics, but uh, not this dip. Uh, this dip is very strange. Uh, and uh, also for 200W drop-off, we probably can see it here as well. Now, we can put them together, we can try to do um, this kind of um, analytic fits, Okay, and um, I would say shelter luminosity fun shelter function does not seem to be a very good fit, okay, in either case. So power law actually fits better. Okay, so we just do this power law fits. But admittedly, this is still highly, highly uncertain, right? 
and uh, it actually presents more problems than answers. For example, one problem, uh, well, aside from uh, the problem that I just mentioned, the dip there at about uh, um, a parallel magnitude of 28 to 29, um, and, and here is a, you know, just to show that, that there's only moderate evolution between these two ratios. And uh, focusing on the mo most critical question here is that whether those very bright objects can be explained at all. Uh, and the thing is that probably yes, we have heard about several options, right? Uh, and uh, one thing that I'm showing here in particular is this uh, feedback of free burst models by, by Deco et al. Um, and uh, once again, I'm amazed by theorists. Uh, they can make things work. Um, and uh, well, but, but if we go to higher ratios, still it's a huge uh, excess there as compared to this uh, most optimal uh, prediction. But uh, maybe they are not at uh, very high ratios. So I, I'm running out of time, so I've just uh, put, this up, uh, put up this slide here. Reminding people that actually, um, you know, that I think I think you know people now should be comfortable uh, saying that uh, realization happened at around redshift of 70, um, because we have uh, do have those candidates there, and uh, this is my summary slide. Uh, thank you very much. I was wondering, uh, thank you, by the way, that was awesome, uh, Irini at uh, NASA. Um, so I was wondering, uh, why didn't you use some of the MIRI data that you have for some of these fields to help constrain uh, the effect of dust attenuation on some of the dropout tests that you're doing? You mean uh, try to test whether some of those are are uh, uh, contaminants? Yes. Yeah, we uh, with dust attenuation. Yeah. Right. So we actually look at uh, say like a Herschel data in, in those fields, and none of those are uh, Herschel sources. So if they are those are very dusty kinds, uh, like people suspected, mm -hmm. uh, they ought to be you know for our emitters. But uh, none of those ours, uh, none of our sources are. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that we actually screen out those, like I said, we just thrown away. We have uh, thrown away those uh, very bright objects uh, that, you know, brighter than 26.0 magnitude. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, this effectively, I think, remove uh, those very dusty guys. Okay. Yeah. Now we can talk about details. Okay, cool. Offline. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, very nice work, Hao Jing. Um, it would be interesting to see what fraction of these brighter objects could be black holes, dust-obscured black holes, or accreting black holes that somehow mimic like bright galaxies. What do we need? More MIRI data? Yeah, MIRI data will be great. Uh, I only have 15 minutes, so yeah, uh, I cannot go on to that. Uh, but yeah, so you know, those are bright objects. Uh, I suspect we do have some preliminary proof that uh, they, are, they are AGNs at uh, lower redshifts. I'll, I'll just make a quick comment, and I'll <coughs> Marsha Riki, University of Arizona. Um, we had intended for that June Jade's release for the raw data to go public as well, and so we'll have to check what went wrong with setting the permissions in MAST. All right, great. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, poster pops, and we're gonna be showing the next three uh, names up. So if your name is up on the screen, you can come up, and it'll rotate through. So um, the first set of three names, so go ahead and come on up, and then you'll see your poster, and then you'll see Inte will become number one, and then it'll cycle through. And it'll be two minutes for each, and I'll be pretty strict on the two minutes. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie and 
Currently, I study at Tufts with Marcassini, Daniel Marcassini, and this is my poster. Um, few things I would like to point out in my poster. So the main topic of this poster is searching for quiet and galaxy in the fresco catalog, which observe in good south and good north. Um, we did SC SED fitting with the BackPy SED fitting code, and then the selection criteria we use are right here. So there are two over density that we discover in each one in good south and good north around redshift of five. So we use that spec C over density to select our redshift criteria here. So we look for galaxy our redshift from four to six, and then we choose galaxy that have star stellar mass bigger than nine and specific star formation rate less than negative nine. And another more interesting selection criteria that we use is using the UVJ diagram, but it's not our normal UVJ diagram because we know UVJ diagram only works uh, more efficiently in low redshift. So we choose this arbitrary green line right here to look for galaxy that live above that line. And the galaxy that fall within those selection criteria are highlighted in the red circle. Um, in total, we see 14 galaxies combining good south and good north. And here are some of the more interesting ones that I picked out. So you see their SED fitting um, right here, and then there's also image cutout um, of each of the galaxy. And we also attach the near cam grism data right here. So I think for all these four galaxies that we selected to show in the poster, um, important thing to point out is they have prominent bombing break and no detection of emission lines. So yeah. And make sure to check out all the posters. Uh, hi, Mark. Do you oh, hear me? Online. I'm talking on television, yeah. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm, an, uh, I'm in Taizhang, a postdoc at STSCI. Uh, I have a poster to advertise a recent JWST series of spectroscopic study on Lyman alpha emitters. Uh, Lyman alpha observations have been broadly used to study reionization as the observability of Lyman alpha is connected uh, with reionization topology. So, uh, we analyze the three reionization near uh, Lyman alpha emitters targeted in the series near spec observations. Uh, we find many emission line features and analyze them to study the detailed properties. Uh, and, uh, and these Lyman alpha emitters were spectroscopically confirmed already in the previous CAG MOSFET observations with their Lyman alpha detection. So we compare the Lyman alpha properties between the CAG and JWC observations. Uh, also, we analyze the cross dispersion direction profile of Lyman alpha confirming a spatially extended Lyman alpha in one of the targets. And finally, uh, we examine if the galaxies can form ionized bubbles large enough for the escape of Lyman alpha based on the emission line measurement from the near spec data. Uh, the study particularly the opens up the self-consistent approach to study reionization by constraining the ionization photon supplies from the reionization near galaxies as well as mapping the ionized bubble from the Lyman alpha detection. So to please visit the poster during uh, the breaks or to find more details from the paper on archive. And I will have a dedicated in-person poster session during afternoon break session tomorrow. So please come to visit me and talk more about it. Uh, thank you. Hope you can hear me well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Uh, I'm Marina Chimarenska. I'm working with Sakima Tech, and I'm first year PhD student. So our work uh, based on the data from Uncover, and we want to talk more about the luminosity function. So first of all, to compute the luminosity function, we need uh, the number of galaxies and also the effective volume. So to compute the effective volume, we used the new lensing model computed by Lucas Furte. So for the higher achieved uh, catalog, we used uh, the sample from Hakim Attack paper. So it includes 19 galaxies in the redshift from 9 to 13. 
Here on the first fig like figure two, actually, you can see the SED of one of the galaxy, as example. So the top set is a SED uh, computed with a photometry that we have, and below you can see the spectroscopic uh, results of it. So also four objects from the sample were observed with spectroscopy, and we have uh, all of the ERS shift completely confirmed. So that's what you can see on a figure three. So once we have our higher shift catalog and lensing, we can move to the luminosity function, which is a figure four. Our luminosity function is presented here in a solid line uh, with a blue color. Also, the other lines uh, and plots, uh, it's uh, observational and theoretical models that we have. You can see that uh, from our results, we have an overdensity on the bright end of luminosity functions. And we still need to have more observational results uh, to explore the faint end of luminosity function. So for that, we will have in cycle two the program Glimpse, uh, which will observe the another uh, galaxy cluster to zoom in more and then find the fainter objects and work more on the luminosity function. Thank you. Hello, I'm Taiko Xiao. I'm a second year grad student at Johns Hopkins University working with Dr. Denko. And I'm interested in cosmology, especially high redshift galaxies, first generation of stars, and also the epoch of reionization. So finding the first generation of stars, or so-called the pop three star, uh, has been awaited for more than decades. But um, even in the JWC era, it's really difficult and almost impossible to directly detect individual pop three stars. But if we can collect a cluster of stars, uh, the lights can boost the um, light uh, radiative radiation to the detect, uh, detectable regime. And then we can use JWST to observe it and detect it. So um, in the first year of JWST scientific observation, we have been observed several um, star clusters at high redshift, and such as the Sunrise Arc, down to a few parsecs. And in our study, MAX 0647-JD, which is a redshift 10.17 galaxy, in the near cam image data, we are able to resolve it as having two components, which might be the most distant galaxy merger or individual star clusters down to a few tens of parsecs. And uh, in the near spec spectroscopic data, we can confirm the spectroscopic redshift to be 10.17 based on eight emission lines. And physical properties, including like ionization parameters and also the metallicity, are all as expected from the low redshift galaxies. And luckily, we are awarded for JWST Cycle 2 program, so we are going to observe this object again using MIRI and also the near spec high resolution. And we also have another JWST Cycle 2 program to observe this redshift 10 arc and we can study those individual clumps and star clusters at redshift higher than 10 regime. So stay tuned, more data is coming. Hi, so I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Jules Witzok. Um, I'm a postdoc at uh, the Kavli Institute for Cosmology in Cambridge. And um, this is to briefly present our discovery uh, of carbonaceous dust grains in the very early universe, which is uh, going to appear in nature um, over the next uh, couple of days. So uh, as part of the Jade survey, uh, which we've already heard a little bit about, uh, we've taken some very, very deep um, near-infrared spectroscopy, in uh, particularly in the prism um, low resolution mode. And um, some of our uh, galaxies, we've been able to, uh, the continuum has sufficient signal to noise to really look into um, some of the properties of the dust attenuation. Um, and what was really surprising to find is that some of these very early galaxies show a hint of the UV um, absorption, um, the dust absorption bump at 20, 2175 angstroms. And the most 
A uh, distant example we have of this is uh, at Redshift 7, which you can see on the right. And uh, I think this is a really, uh, you know, exciting way for us to learn about the uh, first production of metals and also of dust of these very, very young galaxies, as well as uh, learning about their star formation histories. You know, how long ago have they started to, to form stars and when did those stars start to produce dust? And so if you have any questions, please reach out to me um, either via email or Slack, and I'm very happy to, to chat about this more. Thanks. Let's go ahead and thank all the speakers for the first session again. So we now have lunch in the cafe. Um, the session starts again with the second High Redshift uh, Galaxy session at 1.30. I'd like to ask everyone to come here at 1.25 so we can start on time. So thank you very much. Enjoy lunch. Recording has stopped.